Live from the Green Room Studios, from the spacious property of Bates Nursery and Garden Center, 3810 Whites Creek Pike, it's the At Home Show with Josh Carey and David Bates. And good morning, everyone. I'm David Bates. Again, that is not Josh Carey. Nope. Adam Chapman alongside today, and we want to welcome you into the At Home Show here live from the Green Room every Saturday morning. From Bates Nursery and Garden Center, and uh, we're here to talk about all things gardening, and you know, we may throw in a little DIY um, on the side. You never know. We uh, invite questions in through our social media channels, and there are many and varied through Instagram, Facebook. Pick something and message us. <laughs> <laughs> we will. And we'll get that question out there. We're going to be bringing up uh, our our co-conspirators on the other end of the studio here in just a few moments. But first of all, we're going to go to the weather. We will say good morning to Tyler. Good morning, Tyler, by the way. Good morning, David. How are you doing? I'm doing well, and we're glad to be here this morning. And uh, so the forecast looks like a lot of sunshine. And today is, of course, Saturday, the 17th of September, and we're going to have uh, partly cloudy conditions, 87 degrees. Uh, it's a very comfortable 59 here currently at Bates Nursery Station here uh, near just outside the green room. So a uh, very nice start to the day will be a pleasantly mild fall day. And that's going to continue on. We're going to have a mini heat wave, however. Come midweek, Tuesday, Wednesday, 96, Tuesday, 98 on Wednesday. Uh, looks like that there are some locations in the mid upper Midwest that can see triple digits yep. this week for a couple yep. of days. So hopefully it will be a very short-lived event. But we do, uh, as soon as we get past that Thursday, back down to 87, 83 Friday, where, and we move back into the more traditional uh, fall temperature so we're going to take a quick here look at the big radar map and i left it on this one intentionally this is the uh, tropical mm -hmm. storm fiona down yep. here and it's uh it's projected to perhaps make a category one uh, it that doesn't mean that it will have no effect big time rainmaker uh some areas of the dominican republic puerto rico could uh indeed see perhaps a foot of rainfall uh unfortunately we know what a foot of rainfall yeah. looks yes, like it's not a good look no. it's like a very yeah. large foot it's a big foot it's a bigger foot than you realize it's it, you would swear it's a size 14 really leaves a lasting imprint well it, and, uh, and that's because it is an acre foot many acre uh, foot yes. of water and that's yes. and that's bad there's nowhere for it to go when yes. it's that much so this uh storm system currently is, uh should not really impact the uh the main the continental united states it's going to kind of track up the coast and go out this way but we will as you look in here and we'll zoom in here a bit on the middle tennessee area you see it's really there's dry. no precipitation it's going to be dry, dry so dry. so we're looking forward to uh a very comfortable next few days maybe a little heat in the middle of the week but it's short and sweet and out of here and we've made it through june this year so i we think can we can make it through this a couple of days we can make it will not days. be now, a big deal we've now do keep your uh, watering uh, hoses handy though if you're going to be coming out and buying some trees and stuff and plants today so uh, well watering is one of those things that people need to be cognizant of when whatever time of year yes. it is and it unless we're going through a, a deluge type situation which we've been known to go through at times uh you really need to be cognizant of watering at all times particularly when you first plant and there's a lot of that going on right now folks are very much interested in that we've got a lot of things to talk about on the show today we've gotten in uh, a plethora of truckloads of plants and uh, so we'll be discussing that as we go through the show. We're going to welcome in Caroline Gant and Austin Lowen. Welcome in, guys. Good morning. Good morning. And I see a lot of a uh, colorful array on your end of the studio as well as ours. We're, ours are more in the pansy and uh, uh, are those mother load 
junipers down here on this oh, end. Looks uh, like it. Yeah. Uh, the, no, these are gold strike. Uh, gold strike, which appears to be another type of uh, mother load. It's a, yes. It's a there. Maybe those are uh, a. Those will look to be Juniperus horizontalis as opposed to, gen, well, even Motherlow's horizontalis. I think so, yeah. We won't go too technical here, but <laughs> but uh, uh, they are low-growing types and very bright and colorful, and it just goes to show you there's a lot of color you can put in your landscape without it actually being flowers. So that's a good thing to keep in mind. So welcome in, guys. What's going on in your brains and in your world this morning? Well, since we're talking about it, since we're talking about... Can y'all hear me? No. Oh, you're, Tyler. You're Close up a bit, Austin. Am I, I'm in. I'm you're on in it. Now. Okay. All right. All right. All right. I'm here. We did a theme this week of all Isley stuff. So, David, you wrote in your newsletter this week about our Isley truck that came in on Monday. I missed that truck because I'm off on Mondays. Mm -hmm. It's an exciting <laughs> truck, though. But it is. It was a great uh, full semi-load. No, that's one of those you almost hate to miss, though. I know. That's it, the thing. It, I, it's I like, like a, unloading that truck. It's like a treasure hunt when yeah. you're unloading those things. You go, oh, look here. It's a ooze and ahs kind <laughs> of a truck. It is. And uh, it comes out of the West Coast from Isley Nursery, uh, which is one of the coolest nurseries in the country. Boring, Oregon. Boring and I'm, Oregon. That is an actual city that is not uh, an observation on the, the state temperament. Of no. <laughs> it is the actual name of the town that they're in mm -hmm. is boring. Yep. So they came in this week, and we decided to decorate the whole green room with all Isley stuff. So some of the coolest Japanese maples you're going to find and also the coolest conifers that you can grow. So we try our best to get the conifers that will live here. You know, there's a lot of conifers that live in Oregon very well that don't necessarily live in Middle Tennessee very well. But... We, uh, Julie Patterson, who orders all of our plants and has for the past, what, 26 years, um, does like a that. great job of getting the plants that will live in Middle Tennessee. So we've got plenty of conifers to look at. More maples than I think we've ever had. I, I don't know about y'all, but I feel like we have more now than we've ever received. So um, many. So yeah, they're starting to show some fall colors. Some of them are still as red as red can be. Some of them are green, getting ready to turn different colors, all sorts of leaf shapes and styles. Weeping habits, upright habits, all of that. So golly. all the things. Yeah, anything, that's not even all we're getting. Yeah, anything that you're looking um, for with respect to, uh, if you want to see the greatest diversity of uh, growth habits, colors of foliage, the fall color as you already mentioned is coming up. Uh, uh, Tamukiyama is one that comes to mind. Mm -hmm. It's especially great fall color. Uh, you need to come check them out. Uh, they tend to go quick, pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. even though yes. they are not, and they're not an inexpensive item for your landscape, but they are a very much a statement. And getting them in at this time of year really goes a long way towards making it as easy as possible. Simply because uh, things, even though this week might not look like it, this far as the cooling off part goes, that will be uh, happening more and more as we move through the fall season. Even though we're still technically in summer mm -hmm. we are mm -hmm. so uh, caroline i expect that uh, you have a number of questions out there for us oh i do are we ready to dive well, on uh, in? unless there's something other tidbit that you want to add in i know your world is all things tropical all uh, things tropical yeah it's it's an exciting world uh we do have a lot of cool stuff right now yeah, and, so. what, and what, speaking of exciting, we will talk about this, that we do have our uh, the actual structural part of our uh, connected greenhouse structure uh, done. We are, mm -hmm. uh, this next week, beginning to put the uh, roof structures on those, so that will be very nice and give us the opportunity to have covered uh, areas where the you know, rain or shine, you'll be able to have a large area that's in the dry, and it goes all the way from the checkout all the way back to the back of the greenhouse area that you can uh, be in and uh, avoid the elements. And as we move through the winter season, it'll, it's going to give us a, uh, a much larger area. We've we've typically have had uh, Adam to put all of our plants away yes. in what we call house greenhouse. number one yeah. here, which is a, mm -hmm. and it, it makes it appear that we're out of business, even though we're not. So right. uh, it looks like uh, this winter, it will create a much better opportunity for folks to come out and shop just to be able to look around and have a place to uh, be in a more controlled environment and not quite so extreme, uh, regardless of what it's doing outdoors. So there's that. So Caroline, 
Fire away. Tell us what you got. All right, here we go. We've got a mom question to start from our very own Miriam. Good morning, Miriam. Hi, hey, Miriam. Miriam. <laughs> <laughs> Are all moms perennial? Any tips for planting and wintering over? Well, good question, mm. Miriam. And yes and no, I guess, is an yeah. answer. Uh, sometimes, a lot of times, moms do perennialize, and they'll they'll come back you know, year after year. Uh, one thing you got to know is that you know, nurserymen to create mums to bloom in the fall when we want them to, they do a number of pinching, sometimes once, sometimes twice. They'll top them. They'll take the tips out of them. Whenever they do that, they create more herbaceous growth, so more more leaves, and then that creates this really nice bloom set on top in the fall. If you don't do that with mums, they typically bloom a lot earlier. So like in the summertime, you're going to see the mums bloom um, if they do perennialize. Now, we try to separate our garden mums from our perennial mums um, in the greenhouse area versus the perennial area because not all of them do perennialize all that great. Now, for the most part, they will. If you get them in a full sun environment, um, they're going to come back for you. But they are not going to bloom at the in the fall season like they typically do. No, and they, um, won't, they won't have that nice round shape either no. unless you shear them two or three times. Right. And, and I was going to say the uh, term you used, which is the correct term, pinching, mm. really – uh, doesn't reflect what actually happens. And back in the day, um, you know, and particularly for greenhouse-grown cultivars, they would simply go through and pinch those off with their, with their thumbnail. Mm -hmm. However, when you get tens of thousands of them, that's mm -hmm. not practical. No. So they <laughs> tend to take shears and trim them, and by doing so, it it does uh, greatly affect when they come into bloom. If you didn't do it, they would be very leggy mm -hmm. you would have fewer blooms mm -hmm. and they would bloom much earlier mm -hmm. and they would last far less long because they're blooming when the weather is hot mm -hmm. so by delaying that to the later in the season you get a lot more bang for your buck so to speak mm -hmm. yeah and there are certain cultivars specifically that are certainly perennial that will come back tried and true every year what's that one sheffield, sheffield pink. pink i that bought is, one last you week did buy one. i did and i've already planted it because i'm so on top of things it's a really good mom i I'm mean excited. it comes back without a problem it gets really wide just so you know that it's not like a really you know perfect round bush or anything it gets wide like big <laughs> yeah and one of the mistakes that i think is very common is for people to plant one in an area where perhaps they have conifers or other desirable broadleaf plants without realizing that it's going to get so wide yes. and, and so big. So you need to be very mindful of what is growing around it. Otherwise, you're going to have, you can yeah. do a lot of damage to yeah. uh, plants that are perhaps much more dear uh, cost-wise. So you know, give it some room, yeah, mm -hmm. put it in a spot where you're, you're going to be able to control it. And if you're not going to uh, commit yourself, a lot of people really are very antsy when it comes to trimming they yes. they, they there's they, a lot they get of afraid and they get uh, well you know i don't know if they, they need to go uh have a counseling session to be <laughs> able to be okay with themselves they feel right. like they're doing something wrong that the plant it, it hurts it and it does you know they don't have at least they've never articulated it to us right we that don't they're know in pain that yes. they have feelings yes uh, they seem to respond well to it so we're going to interpret that as a good sign yes. so mm -hmm. people need to be not so afraid of using the shears except on the things that you should be and maybe we'll talk about that a little later on but mums are not one of them mm -mm. yeah so when it comes to early spring like whenever they first started leafing out and starting to kind of grow up a little bit and get get a lot of foliage let's cut those back a little bit and get them get, get, uh, you'll produce a lot more stems and a lot more blooms so that's an early spring job and but when he says a, a little bit, that means half. to the ground. <laughs> That's pretty much. I mean, you you really have to cut them severe. Now, yes, one right. of the things if you if you cut them back, here's where you can lose them. If you cut them back after they finish blooming in the fall, they're they are a hollow stem plant. Yes, and they can rot. They can the rot out to get yeah. water in same, those stems. So. Same thing. Incidentally, same thing with uh, ornamental grasses. Uh, that's why you want to let the the leaves stay through at least February. Yeah. And then cut them back. Yeah, so, it's it, it, not even a bad thing to wait until you see signs of, of new growth. growth. Yeah. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. cut them back and you'll be right. good. Yep. All right. All right. There All you right. go, Mary. We, uh, we have a question here on the... We have a question? On the At Home Show page, yeah. All right. Um, Linda is asking, my desert rose has pods on them. What are they and do I need to cut them off? 
Your desert rose has pods. Pods? What do you think? You think? Yeah, those could That's be. That's how she described it. Could it could be blooms, buds. Well, they could be um, extraterrestrial <laughs> attachments that are at a, <laughs> that are at a very small scale. What Josh and I have often referred to as uh, mufos. They're miniature unidentified flying objects. Mm, but that's probably what it is. Yeah. It could be that. It could be, well, it could be seed pods. It could be seed pods. A picture would help if she's able to take a photo. Um, yeah, yeah you pods can, on a desert rose sounds interesting. I guess it's more proper to call them muaps now. Mu-ap. Yeah, because yeah. they don't say... Uh, 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 they're miniature unidentified aerial phenomena. Yes, yes. Not, not mufos, but muaps. Mm. Is the, there, using is there the a, new vernacular. I'm sorry I keep... <laughs> <laughs> We're going off the rails here. I've never seen seeds no. on a. On I, a I haven't rose. seen them on a desert rose. I mean, the only thing I can think is that it's buds, but. Um, oh, you're right. It could be buds about to about flower to bloom. And open. But that would be. Or it could be spider eggs. If they, I guess, yeah, if they like look they... more like a how a, a rose hip would look or something, right? Well, wait a minute. That mm. would be a bloom. Wait a minute. You're just going to throw that bomb out there? It could be spider eggs. <laughs> just in your a house. thought. I was like, yeah. I don't know. I see them all over my house. Not on my plants, but maybe it could happen. Yeah. But yeah, a photo would be pretty spider helpful. Spider eggs that one. are usually pretty easy giveaway yes. because there's the little the, the silk webbing. Yeah, and, the yes, little silk yes. giveaway. So. I do oh, want to see a picture of this. I so do. I'm, I'm yeah. interested. I love a good desert rose. Okay, I Linda, we're too. calling on you to send in a photo. However, <laughs> you can get it to us. Yep. If you want to message it, comment it. We'll we'll get it. All right. All right. Let's get to some hydrangea questions. Always. Who is excited about that? Hey. <laughs> Here we go. First up, what oak leaf hydrangea varieties would be okay in full sun or full morning sun? Oh goodness! Okay, Mor- you morning had to sun. Stretch before you answered that Mor- one. <laughs> morning sun. I would say all of them in morning sun yes. would be fine. Mine are um, in morning sun. Uh-huh. But full blown sun. I mean, I've seen them growing in in almost full sun. But they can. They can. They just stress. Yes, they, they're the leaves usually get burned in in the summer, and mm-hmm. yeah. So and there's no difference like with variety. Like an oak leaf mm-hmm. hydrangea is an oak leaf hydrangea. There mm-hmm. are certain varieties that grow, you know, either taller or shorter or have a different fall color. None of them are particularly no, small. Though. Exactly. And none of them are particularly better for the full sun. No. Uh, you know, like Adam said, they can live in full sun, y'all. They can, but they're going to stress. They yeah. are certainly going to yeah, stress they, the topmost they don't, growth. They don't ever have that really lush looking mm-hmm. foliage like mm-hmm. the yeah. ones that get uh, a little shading in the hottest part of the day. They always look a lot more lush. Mm-hmm. Uh, when they get that. Yeah, they keep that green. But it, it won't kill them. No, yeah. it won't kill them in the full sun. But they, what, the, what I've noticed that happens is that they get that like reddish foliage on yes. top. Mm, like it's almost, yeah, very much so sooner. Yeah, um, and, and the, the leaves do, like David was saying, they tend to be stunted they do. Uh, in full sun. Mm-hmm. So morning sun, great. Afternoon, let's shade them guys a little bit. Yeah, Let's shade them a little bit. Mm-hmm. All right. Second hydrangea question. Here we go. Are you ready? All hydrangeas, all, all the time. The Everybody time. loves them. You got to. When is it time to prune back hydrangeas? Oh, depends. Three thirty. <laughs> totally depends. <laughs> it depends. If if it's a uh, paniculata like a, a limelight, you can prune them. Um, really, you can pl- prune them beginning of spring if you want to, or I mean, because they bloom on new growth. So mm-hmm. you just want to make sure you don't prune them, say, l- uh, in the spring at all, because you're going to prune off the, the blooms that are, be- are forming. Now, oak leaves bloom, like we were just talking about. On the previous. Leaves, yes, on mm-hmm. the previous year's growth. So you want to make sure you prune those after they bloom. Otherwise, if you prune them in the winter, you're going to prune off the buds from last year that have formed for last year. So. Yeah, and sometimes, and we've got several at our house, about every third or fourth year we just sacrifice yes. the flowers yes. just because they get too big otherwise yes. mm-hmm. and so we just go ahead and cut them back and what you get in return of that is really lush wonderful looking growth you do miss the flowers for one year but you know all things considered it's a uh, it's a good deal mm-hmm. because they will get too big and, you know we've got snow queen that back in the day was supposed to be a Dwarf, dwarf. <laughs> yeah. uh, not very dwarf. No. It's only dwarf no. if you cut them severely. Yes, and uh, that's and to keep them dwarf. You have to keep cutting them severely, at least every few years. The, otherwise, they get up to three or four feet tall, pretty fast. Yes, uh, and I've, we've also have Annabelles in our houses, and like your, uh, those, of course, flower on the current year uh, right. as well. So we cut those back early. 
uh, in the spring, yes. and they do wonderfully. And th- again, on those, we They're find hollow, that, are those hollow stemmed? Are they not? They hollow are hollow stem. Yeah, uh, we generally wait until there's the first emergence of yeah. leaves. Supernum, I don't yeah. like the way they look persistent over the winter time, even uh, you know, with the spent flower tops mm-hmm. on. They'll, I think they look quite nice. We we'll wait till they start pushing out, and then we'll cut them back almost to the yeah. ground. Yeah. Uh, Austin, uh, a few weeks ago, you were talking about. I guess it was your mom's mm-hmm. uh, hydrangea in her yard that that you talked about pruning later, and it also created a lot of more flowers and smaller ones, which really added greatly to the redu- reduction of flopping mm-hmm. on them. And they're really bad, particularly when we get these. Big thunderstorms in August, they get loaded up with water, and these huge flowers have flimsy little stems comparatively, and they can't handle all that weight, and they, they tend to mm-hmm. flop they over. Flop. So that helps a lot also. It really as, does. as a cultural practice, it really mm-hmm. does a good deal. Yeah, I know, and it can be scary. Like y'all talked about earlier, Ed, people are scared to prune. But hey, <laughs> if you, yeah, I know it's weird to prune in the spring. It's really weird, but this is a a, a – preventative measure measure i guess Uh, so whenever they are growing and actively growing and looking good that's when we want to shorten and if we do that then like david said we get more stems we get more blooms blooms are going to be smaller but they're going to be tighter tucked in amongst the foliage and they're not going to flop out on you near as bad and a little pro tip that many uh if not almost all um large growers do is they do cycle pruning throughout the growing season on those where every two weeks they will prune about a, a third of the mm-hmm. crop. Mm-hmm. That way they always have some coming on that mm-hmm. are otherwise they would all bloom at once and then they'd be done. Right. And, you know, nobody likes that. No. no. And also let's get to the last hydrant or one of the last. Macrophilus. The, the macrophilus. Yep. The yep. endless summer collection you're probably familiar with, the original blue. Um, Nico's. Nico blue. All mm-hmm. of the big leaf hydrangeas. Guys, we really want to try to keep those stems up, and we want to do as little pruning as we can over the winter because they bloom off of those old stems. And what happens a lot of times is that they will crack out foliage in the spring, and then here in Middle Tennessee, like what happens a lot, we get a late frost, and it'll whack back that foliage that was already growing. So if you get that, if you have stems that you cut back short, those buds that cracked and then got whacked (laughs) by the frost (laughs) – you're going to see new growth from the roots, and whenever that happens, you do not get a good bloom set, if mm-hmm. at all, during the whole season. So let's keep the sticks up, as ugly as they look. I know, macrophyllous stems look horribly ugly over the wintertime, but we're going to do minimal pruning on those. Keep those up as much as we can. That way, if they do crack out foliage from the top and then we get a freeze, it'll knock back that foliage, but then they've got more buds down below that yeah. can still crack and, it gives and then you, bloom. it gives you a good opportunity to plant something in front of them that will stay low and ha- give some interest that will kind of cover those yeah. bad-looking stems. Exactly. So, you know, that layering in your landscape really does a lot to help soften uh, the looks for the transitional mm-hmm. times of years in particular. Mm-hmm. Now, something else to add about the microphylas. Nowadays, most of them are reblooming. Mm-hmm. So even if you do have uh, a bad, we have a bad frost and those buds get hit, um, as long as you stay uh, on with your fertilization uh, program, which you will need to do for microphylas because they're very heavy feeders, mm-hmm. Uh, you will get another bloom uh, later in the summer. So, uh, and, you know, that's almost all of them are that way now. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. All right. All right. Y'all that's did it. Big talk. It about thoroughly happened. answered. <laughs> yes. Are we ready for another? Hey, hey this, oh. for just a moment here, why don't we take a little sidetrack for just a moment? We talked about uh, all this growing of things and how to be productive and how to get your very best results out of them. It really all be- begins when you plant those plants regardless of what they are, be it hydrangea or whatever, Earth Mix Garden Products assures you of having a level of success that you won't find with other products. Earth Mix Garden Products are uh, developed and uh, blended right here in Nashville, Tennessee. There are, is no chemical additives to the products at all. It's all 100% organic. And we take a lot of steps to make sure that it is not only organic, and organic is great, but it's also very viable, productive, truly living soils with a, uh, a lot of microbial activity in it. So no matter what product you're using, be it the Earth Mix Supernatural, which is kind of the basis of many of the other products and is a standalone product itself, the, uh, the, uh, the very best uh, compost you can purchase, that... Uh, 
or EarthMix Garden, which is the most widely known and used product. Uh, and I think what is many of our favorite product, EarthMix Landscape, uh, that is, except for Caroline, she's a pro Gannick's eye gal. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, for, I am. For, and no matter which of those products you use, you're going to get the very best results. One thing about pro Gannick's eye is that there's no peat in it. So if you uh, really detest those little fungus gnats that come around, those come as a result of peat being used mm-hmm. in soil mixes. So if you use pro Gannick's eye, you will not get those because they are not attracted to that. So if you want to find out all about EarthMix garden products, go to the website, earthmix.net, and right there you can click on the About EarthMix tab. There's an extensive blog, a lot of uh, backstory on development of it. You may find it interesting, so check that out. All the products are listed here, and if you want to also uh, find EarthMix garden products, you're only going to find that at the, the best dealers, independent garden centers, and other independent retailers that are in uh, Tennessee, Kentucky, even in southern Ohio, Indiana. Check that out uh, over at the Find Earth Mix tab. There's, uh, there'll be pins there for all the various locations, and it'll also tell you which products are carried in each of the locations. So check that out. And for more information, make sure you go out to earthmix.net because remember this, success in gardening begins at the ground level when you use EarthMix Garden products, and we appreciate you giving us a moment to talk about that and help you to have success in your gardening. It makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. All right. There Mm -hmm. we go. Here we go. I love Proganics Indoor. It's the best. (laughs) Well, we all have our our favorites. I also like the landscape a lot. I mean, I like it all, but... I'm using Indoor to start some seeds right now. Are you? Mm -hmm. It's, It's wonderful. Are you starting them indoors? I am starting them outdoors. Oh, oh he's violating wow. the code of conduct. <laughs> Getting <laughs> wild. <laughs> we call it R and D. Okay, all right. Around here. <laughs> all right. So this is kind of a hot topic this summer. Fire Chief Arborvitae is green on top, but brown below. Is it lack of water? Well. Well, good question. Let's do this. It's been a lack of water this year for most Arborvitae, but I will say Fire Chief Arborvitae in general, and this is almost across the board with Arborvitae, y'all, is they have green foliage on the outermost part of the plant where light and and um, you know airflow is getting to the plant. That's where the healthy part of the foliage is. On the interior of the plant, it gets smothered out. There is literally no light that gets in there. There's no airflow that gets in there. So all of that just kind of turns brown, and it will persist if you don't get in there and kind of rake it out. Um, so that's just natural with Arborvitae. If it is green on the outermost part of the plant, your plant is fine. But if you do get in there and look, you'll almost always certainly see brown foliage. That's, that's the reason it's just not, it's it's not photosynthesizing out on the inside. It's all on the outside. So that's perfectly normal. Whenever you start seeing browning on the outermost part of the plant, that's when you have a problem. Uh, but if yours is green on the outside, then you're doing fine. Fire Chief is fine. And that's true with all conifers. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. After all, if uh, conifers did not shed those interior that interior foliage, you would have no pine needles mm-hmm. if you like mulching with pine needles. Nope. They come from pine trees, and right. they, they naturally shed those. They just rake them up and bale them, and that's how we get them and everyone else gets them. So mm-hmm. uh, interior defoliation with with all conifers is very normal yes. and it is a direct relation to how much available light if they're in a area that gets a little bit more shade than perhaps full sun they're going to be a little more susceptible to that you may notice that it looks a little thinner down in there than it would otherwise yeah so, so sometimes it takes uh what i usually let folks know is you know it could be even uh, two three years yeah. before it starts to you know really get thin uh you know because the plant wants to live and so it, it's going to do its best to do so but given its conditions eventually it will kind of get so thin, yeah so. it does away naturally with the parts yes. of the plant that don't contribute yes. to the overall production and viability of the health of the plant it's just i i, I can better live without these and right. it simply sheds them off it does not an indication of things being necessarily negative it's just an indication that the plant's dealing with the changes that it's going through and we all go through look look at me for instance (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> well, the good thing is is that you've got an Arbor Valley that's still green this year specifically. Uh, there was yes. a news article that came out yesterday on News Channel 2. We all read it um, around here, and it was a big article on Arbor Valley specifically that was dying around Middle Tennessee, and I'm sure y'all have seen this. It's yeah. called June this year. It yep. was. It was a big drought, a big heat wave, and that happened. So if you've got Arbor Valley that's still green, hey. You're doing something good because yep. they took the weather took a lot of them this year. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, and uh, before we go to the next question, it's worth taking just a moment to talk about people being attuned to what the weather is doing currently. And anymore, we are seeing extremes of weather, and and they're coming at times when you might not expect to see it. You know, we we talked about the phenomenon this year that. It seemed as though June and August flip flopped yes. this year. We had we had horrendous heat and dry Drought. conditions in June and August. It was very pleasant. Mm-hmm. It was quite and wet, nice and wet too. And wet. We had plenty of rain. So, so. Um, while you might be prepared for that in August, normally uh, you got to be prepared for it when it occurs, and you only get that information by you know staying attuned to what it is. Whatever you did last year. It's not that it doesn't mean anything. It just may be that this year it's not applicable because the weather conditions have changed. So right. you got to stay attuned to that. We have to adjust our waterings. And Adam, you and I talk about it yep. frequently about how we're going to make adjustments. And for us, it's a, of course, it's a big deal because you know this is what we do for a living. So being able to keep things watered properly without overwatering is a delicate balance. So. Yes. If you've got questions about that, never hesitate to pick our brain on it. But your plants that have been in the ground for several years, are you can't let them go on autopilot during these extreme heat spells. You've got to attend to them. And the yeah. arborvitas that died, many of them have been in the ground for a number of years. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. And it was totally uh, avoidable had you heeded what we tried to, to communicate yes. to you that – well, they really and, need to and be also, it's not. It doesn't just affect them, but you know, it can weaken other plants to the to the point that they become susceptible to to other things. Like right. my my uh, uh, service berries got destroyed by uh, seed or a- apple rust, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I've always had it a little bit, but I think it was because of the drought. Oh, right. it is <clears throat> that it got so bad this year. Uh huh. A stressful plant will, yeah, a a lot of bad things happen worse whenever the plant is stressed Mm -hmm. out, and that's mainly based on water. So anyway, the the long and short of all that is that when you're having issues with plants, you mean stay attuned to them. And Austin talks about this a lot about really looking at plants and paying close attention to what's going on with them. And when you do that, you're going to pick up on those subtle changes, not only from an up close but at a distance. You know, if you've got a row of conifers growing, you're going to be able to pick out. Why does that one look a little different in mm-hmm. color? You know, what's going on with it? Is it spider mice? Is it lack of water? Does it have bagworms on it? What, what is the deal? So you paying close attention really goes a long way to help you mitigate problems and to head them off before they become a major event. Yeah, I had a guest yesterday. He has a row of 10 arborvitaes in a row. Em- emerald greens, the tall skinnies we all think of. Um, he watched them die. He watched six of them. Six out of the 10 are, are now dead. But he watched them from the one at the furthest working down <laughs> in. He watched them die. And I just thought to myself, oh, if you would have just given them some added water, they probably wouldn't have died. <laughs> he even had an ag extension guy come out and come look at him to see if there was some sort of pathogen or pest or whatever. The ag extension yeah. guy said exactly what we're saying here. He said, we had a drought this year. Our bodies are susceptible to that. They're shallow rooted. Very yes. shallow rooted. But if the guest would have just he watched them <laughs> yeah. you know, go. And I thought to myself, golly. If you had just put some water on them, they would have well, probably even just, lived. Even just once. Like, I watered mine yeah. once. Uh-huh. I watered mine, I think, at the end of June. But, I was like, but I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that you drenched so, them yes, when you watered. Yes, I yes. mean, If you're going to water, you may as well do it. You yes. know? I mean, if you're going to drag a hose and get it all out there, you may as well soak them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, you can't really overdo it with the arborvitas if it's they're It's very dry. unlikely. Yeah, very yeah. unlikely. So... Anyway, the extension agent told him to use eastern red cedar, which is our junipers around, you know, our common juniper, which, hey, way better choice. Juniper yeah. ain't dying around town, not yeah. a bit. <laughs> the only trees you see in Lebanon where there's nothing but rock is cedar cedars. trees. I right. mean, and there's a reason for that, because they can live. So yeah. I've seen cedar trees living on the side of like a rock cliff, oh, yeah. you mm-hmm. know, just yeah. right up the road here. Yeah, so. No problem. Yep. Yeah, so juniper may be a better option for you guys instead of yeah. herbs. Okay. All right. 
Here Welcome we go. We've got a houseplant question. Uh-oh. Oh, Caroline's oh. Time to show. Who's going to answer this one? <laughs> it's a hard one. Uh oh. Oh, no. Favorite easy houseplant. Low light can thrive on neglect. Um, Sansevieria is what I would suggest. It doesn't have leaves that are going to brown and fall off. Uh, and you also barely need to water it. I've had one sitting in a dark spot that gets pretty much no sunlight. It's in a room with a window, but I probably haven't watered it in three months. And I'm just kind of testing it to see. And it's. It's still looking great and growing. Um, so that's a great option. It's mother-in-law tongue or snake plant. So are you seeing how much torture it can take? Yes, that, I am. Okay, I like okay, to I'm test just... my plants. I like to push them to the well, edge. Well, you know, here's the paradox uh, in watering that people are in direct conjunction to their house plants. They're, they, they're passed by it many times a day. There it is. Right? Is there something I need to be doing? Mm-hmm. And more often than not, Nothing is exactly what they need to be doing. Just let it go. So the uh, persistence of overwatering as a problem is huge for a great many neophyte gardeners that just don't have the skill set, haven't developed it for yet. For indoor plants. For, for indoor, indoor plants. Yeah. And conversely, for outdoor plants, because <laughs> it's kind water. of out of sight, out of mind, you know, it should be fine. No, they were good. You know, no, we got a good rain, remember? <laughs> you know, they're watered in good. So, uh, it's it it does take that's what a green thumb a green thumb is someone who naturally is well enough attuned to the plant's needs um, to be able to know when it needs some water or needs to be left alone. It is something that can be learned. It is yes. not something that people are innately born with necessarily. Mm-hmm. Some people just seem to be more adept at it than others, but anybody can learn it. That yep. is true. Um, so overwatering is the most common issue with house plants when people come in or call because they're having an issue with a number of types of house plants. Normally it's overwatering, um, but yeah, that's a great one. Thrives on neglect. I've knocked one over and left it laying on the ground outside of its pot for a couple of weeks, and they were fine. Um, Dracaena is also another good option if you're looking for height and just, something that looks just like didn't a feel like standing it up. I just would walk by and look at it and be like, "I'll get to you one day." Um, but yeah, they they literally do thrive on neglect if you can forget it it will survive i think what we've learned here is um <laughs> if you live at caroline's house <laughs> you will be neglected oh absolutely well, when I you mean, have a house of 200 plants inside, inside yeah. and i don't know how many outside yeah they're gonna well one to. thing for sure you don't want to have more than one person in charge of watering your inside plants no my because, husband does not no. do anything but, to because my because you will kill them if you yes. do that mm-hmm. uh-huh. yeah one person watering that's all you need but yeah sansevieria dracaena are i would say the best low light options if you want something leafy spathophyllum peace lily yep. that's pretty low maintenance and it does let you know when it needs to be watered if yes. you're pretty new to plants it'll start drooping and as soon as you water it within like Two hours, if it's real bad, uh, it will, you know. Yeah, I have literally out. seen them where they flop mm-hmm. down mm-hmm. Yeah. on the They're floor, fine. and yeah. then with it, now that's not recommended to do that because no. they they do they do suffer mm-hmm. uh, uh, a lot of dieback as Leaf a result. Drop, yeah. But uh, it will tell you as It'll long as you don't know. wait too long. Hey, what about ZZ plant, Caroline? I know you're not a fan. I, I'm not not a fan. So. You, <laughs> Oh, oh, but, oh, be ambivalent, will you? You want to talk about the one house plant I can't keep alive? Um, <laughs> it's, it's easy. So, those are supposedly really easy. I mean, I have people come in all the time looking for another house plant, and they're like, I have a ZZ that I've kept alive for years, and I kill all my other plants. Um, I can't keep it alive for some unknown reason. I can keep all other house plants alive. Well, it seems like there's you have an inverse relationship here. So, maybe <laughs> yeah. the ZZs are, they need to be watered all the time no and they then, don't well, they're I'm just gonna saying, rot like, them like you, that so but i'm just saying like most people you know, we've just said kill them by overwatering them well i mean if they don't kill that and you're you just said you don't water hardly any of your plants ever apparently <laughs> no i do water other types of my plants i have oh, okay, so okay. many but my cactus and my uh, dracaena sans very and a number of others i don't okay. water that often but i know <laughs> you've had a ZZ. 180 out have of the 200 th- plants <laughs> Austin threw a ZZ outside. Didn't you say that lived over the winter? I'm not yeah. suggesting that whatsoever, but it those are happen. very hardy, very easy plants. They just hate me for some reason. Mm, okay. I've got one at the house. It's called the Raven ZZ, hence it's the name. Cool. It's black. It's black. And I'm not even joking. It's, it's black, y'all. So the new growth comes out beautiful green, just like a regular ZZ looks. And then that darkens after a few weeks to this black color. Mine is beautiful. I got it in a white pot. I mean, I don't know what's wrong with Caroline. 
but mine is money. <laughs> oh. ha- is, is there a is there a ZZ named uh, Top? Top. Oh. <laughs> oh. There it is. That was a good one. They they they're, they almost it's just too natural. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. So anyway, ZZ top. Anyway, I do have a ZZ right now. I've had it for about four months, and it's it's doing great. I They're haven't fine. I haven't watered that one uh, probably one time since oh. I brought it home. Mine sits on my front porch, and it, it gets a good amount of of heat. Definitely not a ton of sunlight, uh, like direct sunlight, but a lot of heat. Um, oh, golly, it may be once every three weeks I'll water it. Um, like I said earlier, with that, I'm a, whenever I'm watering, I'm watering, so I go out and I soak it deeply. Uh, let it wild. drain totally and then like i said i don't come back for another three weeks to a month on it and it's been great it's growing like a champ you know there is a uh a hedge which is becoming a hedge of uh em- of a green giant arborvita that we planted four years ago mm-hmm. yeah i watered those once once, once yeah that was in august of the first year right and i mean i spent there's i don't know there's 40 or 50 of them. I spent about five hours hand watering them going from plant to plant. I went over them all, I think four or five times where they were, the ground was squishy right. around. Yeah. It's the only time I've ever watered them. Mm-hmm. And we saw no loss with ours this year. No, not one. Every one of them is perfect. And we also you know, did extensive uh, soil preparation. Yes. Yeah. Whether yes. you give those roots really good soil if you know if you've got hard pan clay or churdy soil and you try to plant into that you think that that's the same as giving it something that has enough organic material and particulate matter where the roots get established in too easily it's not the same Mm -hmm. so uh you know you give yourself a chance to have success to get through these droughts by planting correctly on the mm-hmm. front end. You cannot do that after the fact. No. You must do it when you plant. Yes. We're not upselling you. It's it's really uh, it's really an insurance policy to make well, sure you have Well, and the have organics, I, the organics I will help with your indoor plants. That's that's, you know, it's it's a really good indoor mix to use for Mhm. Mm. It's amazing. So, you yep. got to have drainage. Yeah, got to. That whatever soil you use, got to get out of the bottom of that pot or you're going to see issues. Like Caroline <laughs> said, it's staying too wet. Just because it's dry on top does not mean it's dry down below, no. y'all. You and if your it, plant looks good, let it be. Pick it up. Uh-huh. Feel the weight of it. You yep. you know, you know, Most of them you can tell pretty mm-hmm. easily. And if it's too big to pick up, you know, invest 10 bucks in a moisture meter and, mm-hmm. and that'll help you. Yep. Well, put your finger in there. That Hey, this works. Yep. Yes, it does. The original moisture meter. Yep. <laughs> yeah, but drainage is very important. All yep. right, let's get on to another question. Tell us about Queen Ruby cabbages as ornamental plants. Queen Tell Ruby us cabbage. Tell all about it. Sounds like it's a red leaf cabbage, which is great for foliage. Um, and then it's awesome for mixed containers. So with cabbage, generally, if you're going to leave them out in a pot outside, like exposed to all the weather, the cabbage is not going to last through the whole winter here, typically, unless we're just super mild. Mm-hmm. For the most part, when that frost and really heavy freeze sets in, if they're out, um, they're going to get kind of whacked back for the season. You're not going to see a good looking plant through the whole winter. Now, if you keep these cabbages up underneath your porch or covered in an area um, and you screened in back porch, whatever it is, you can keep cabbage literally through the whole winter as long as you keep those elements off of it. So excellent plant to grow. A great feature plant works well with, say, Dusty Miller, which is a silver foliage plant, which is another one that will stay up through the wintertime if you keep it protected. So um, cool plant to grow. Great with mixed containers. Throw some pansies in there with it. Make you a nice mix. We can make one for you. Um, either way, it's worth growing. So I, and an, another question people have a lot is that, you know, these are cabbage and kale and all these kind of Swiss chard. And mm-hmm. aren't these also edible plants? And the, the biggest, and technically you could eat these. However, the ones that are sold for ornamental use uh, have likely had some other chemical herb, uh, in, insecticides mm-hmm. and fungicides used on them. It's not recommended to eat them because... No. Uh, cabbage, uh, you're only doing it for the, for the beautiful foliage, and so worms are particularly bad. It takes a lot, yeah. it takes a lot more, uh, something with a lot more oomph in it to keep them really clean. Right. So if you yeah. if, if you didn't use those chemicals on there, uh, they would tend to be very holy plants, and I'm not talking about in a, a higher powered <laughs> sense. They would have f- physical holes in yes. the leaves. Yes. So, yes. 
Imported cabbage worm is one of the worst insect pests there is, and they love all the brassica family plants, which and is they'll, like they'll, they'll just will, ravage uh, a plant yeah. quickly. Yes. One worm. I mean, literally one worm can and there's never just one. <laughs> but one can do a lot of damage. But oh my god, you got ten worms on a plant and you don't know it for two days? Mm -mm. You don't that, well, you don't have a plant anymore. No, you really don't. It gets stripped. You find him, he's a skinny little caterpillar. Mm -hmm. From day one, day two, he's big around as your finger. Yeah, I mean, seriously. Fat. Uh-huh. Okay. Anyway, all right. <laughs> but anyway, all right, here we go. <laughs> so how do I overwinter caladium? Um, I'm about to start overwintering mine. I'm going to let mine go dormant. You can keep them as a house plant. Uh, that is an option. Some people do that. I have one that I've had as a house plant, although I'd rather let them go dormant and then replant them in the spring. So the way I do that is I will stop watering it, bring it into a shady area that's dry and covered, let it die off. It usually takes two to three weeks for that foliage to turn brown, crispy, and then I cut it all the way back to the dirt. You can leave it in the soil, stick it in a closet. I've done that before. Um, don't water it. The, like I said, it's dormant, which just means it's sleeping. It's not dead. It's still alive. It's just conserving all of its energy. Or you can bring it out of the pot, knock off all of that old soil, cut all the stem back, and then I just put them in paper bags if I have a lot, label them, and then replant them in the spring, and they'll flush back out. But they're really easy to overwinter, same as uh, elephant ear, and bananas, so yeah, and dahlias are the same one. way. And dahlias, gotta throw in the dahlias. Gotta throw those and in. The key is, is to keep them dry. Yes, yeah. like Caroline said, don't water them over the winter. Those bulbs need to stay dry, or they're gonna rot on you. Mm -hmm. They're not growing. They're not actively using water. So if the water's sitting on them, they're just gonna rot. And if you know? you're taking them out of the container and uh, completely getting all the soil off of them. Uh, wrapping them in newspaper mm -hmm. or some other kind mm -hmm. of anti-desiccant material that will keep them, you know, the um, the old adage is, uh, you know, one bad apple can spoil the whole bunch. It's mm -hmm. true with yes. uh, these other uh, rhizomes and tuber type things. If they start to rot, that rot can spread through. So yeah. putting some kind of uh, material in there, it could be perlite, for instance. You can mm -hmm. use that. Mm -hmm. Anything that will help to absorb the moisture and uh, keep them from spreading that rot throughout. Hey, we'll talk for just a moment about where we are today at Space Nursery and Garden Center. Uh, our 90th anniversary, uh, what I like to call our emerald anniversary, and we invite you to come out and see us. Uh, and if you haven't been out before, uh, you're, you're really in for a um, – probably a, a bit of a mind-boggling experience because of the extensive amount of plants. You know, I've, we get somewhat desensitized to it simply because we're here in it every day. Some but, would even say jaded. Yeah. <laughs> good, good. Anyway, <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we lose track of the fact that uh, we have a lot of things here, a huge yeah. amount of things. Beautiful and, things. Uh, and we invite you to come out and see it. And we invite you to come out equipped with information about your specific landscape situation. If you'll take photographs with your uh, smartphone or your tablet and bring those along, it really helps us a lot to be able to uh, look at your unique landscape situation and help you to get the right plants in the right place the first time. So that's the way we try to do it. We don't like that drive-by landscaping technique we really want to try to look at what you've got do you have sun do you have shade is it is it poor drainage is it you know what are the conditions and try to help you narrow down your choices so that you're not just taking a shot in the dark you're really going to have a great chance at success and we expect you to have that and if uh what we also do is to uh, give you some help uh, i do a weekly newsletter you heard talked about earlier and if you just click right here on the green box of batesnursery.com that takes you straight to the page and this week i talked about isley nursery all of these conifers japanese maples you see around the studio this morning are all uh, from isley nursery they are a uh, the name the title i put up there incomparable impeccable isley is not uh hyperbola they are truly uh an incredible place and if you saw that newsletter a couple of years ago we had uh brent furby in the studio we did a, a really a long form uh feature on isley nursery so i encourage you to go to the newsletter and check that out you can also go right here on the bates nursery page and if you'll scan down there are links throughout the newsletter there so check those out and I'll also point you to some a variety of things that we have uh available here 
uh, including Earthmix Garden products. We're a proud seller of those products. And if you're going to have the best success with the best plants, use Earthmix, and that will help you to get the desired result. And that means uh, alive, productive, and really th- flourishing plant so we are conveniently located one mile north of briley parkway at exit 19 on white's creek pike which is just minutes from rivergate opry mills nashville west and i promise you it is worth the drive I mean, look at that <gasps> high speed wow. fl- fly through the greenhouse area Boy, careful! You're gonna hit some. Whoa! Ah! Whoa! Watch that tree there. Anyway. This was Tyler yesterday. He was like absolutely that. flying. He was on a motorcycle <laughs> doing this. I feel like, I feel like it's a, a weird version of Pac-Man or something. Yeah. It, it does look. Look at that. It's Anyways, awesome. The, that's a fly through the. There's the, me. The new sh- <laughs> There's Shannon. <laughs> so anyway, the, this is is this this year or last year? This was yesterday. Was yesterday. Yeah. yesterday. Okay. See, it's anyway. So check that out. Uh, Come out and see us. You might take a little more time than that video yeah. reflects. You <laughs> yes. don't have to look that quickly to be able to absorb everything. You need to be able to check it all out. Uh, get your steps in. Get mm-hmm. your steps in and uh, come enjoy the sunshine and the um, and the surroundings. Mm-hmm. And we're glad to help you in the process. Bates Nursery and Garden Center, beautifying Nashville since 1932. And we appreciate you giving us a moment to discuss that. Before we get back to your questions, I know we got – Several more, Caroline. We do have a few more, but before we get to questions, there's something that I want to know about. <laughs> Tyler, hit that button. What's in bloom? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> What's in bloom? With Austin. <laughs> All right, I'm switching up. I'm switching up. I'm not talking about what's in bloom. I'm tired of talking about crepe myrtle. It's been in bloom for six, eight weeks now. Done with it, but it is still in bloom. Rosa Sharon's still in bloom. Um, he's asters, not going to talk about them, but he's going to mention just, them. Oh, quickly, okay, quickly. <laughs> what I wanted to talk about this morning is what is starting to happen, and that's fall color. I don't know if y'all noticed it, but this week I've started to notice. A lot of big red maples are starting to turn color. A lot of dogwoods are starting to turn color. Um, I saw some Kwanzaa and cherry this morning starting to go their little bit of orange, which is always kind of cool. Yoshino cherries are going yellow, but they're a quick yellow to a drop. You don't see much fall color on those, but they are starting. Uh, Crepe myrtle right now is starting to change a little. Even while they're blooming. That's right. Wow. And uh, let's talk a little bit about sweet gum, Adam, and David specifically. Uh, Sweet gum is so funny to me. Sometimes (laughs) it's, it's a yellow fall color. Sometimes it's a purple fall color it's just got a weird it does what it wants uh, to i think it's climatic it is it's got to be and maybe micronutrient it's something i don't know we have so many sweet gum and we know uh, we all know sweet gum it's a really free cedar so if you have one sweet gum the next year you could have 20 it makes a stand so if you see one you see 20 like i said um and you'll see a bunch of different leaf colors within those sweet gums so i don't know how to explain it but if you see a barefooted you're gonna know also (laughs) yeah that's Mm. right well i can can remember at martin when i was in college there they had several on campus that were big and one tree would have Four colors. I know. I mean, it would have red, it would have purple, it would have yeah. yellow, yellow it would have orange. Yep. Yeah, it's a funny so. tree. So it's pretty cool for some fall yeah. color right there. And then also Japanese maples. I got a few in my yard. Those are just starting to get that fall color change. And I wanted to talk about this earlier. We had talked about how stressful this year was. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a mm-hmm. lot to do with the stress yes. of the season versus and fall, fall color. color. Yes. And it seems like it's happening earlier this year. And I think that's a direct correlation yes, there. Yes, from the from early drought. Early drought and yeah. early heat. Mm-hmm. And it's the not fall just color. the stress of everyday life no no it's no the whole season so <laughs> there you go guys those are things that are starting fall color and we're getting ready to really see it i hope we have a good one this year i think we might mm-hmm. we'll see i, think I don't so. know we'll see well fortunately you know we got rains late, late in the summer yeah, yeah. In which uh normally you know, if we have a poor color year it's because we go into the fall season dry mm-hmm. and it's not the case this year although we haven't had much rain the last couple of weeks right. we're not going into it dry so it looks like our color could be pretty good hopefully them leaves hold on yeah yep. like you said the water's going to keep the leaves on longer so we'll see what we got this year we'll the cooler evening temperatures is probably helping that's another brings out those carotenes and zanzafils there you go big words yeah what tasty what words what he <laughs> all right we got two questions left let's get it this next one is a texas question 
Hey. hey, I was born there. Yep. Tejas. So uh-huh. you will know the answer. Wow. Absolutely. Mm. We live in Texas and need a good grass alternative. No clover, though, as we have bee-eating dogs. Oh. Yeah. That is... Bee-eating dogs. Do you know dogs. what to say to that? that? Bee-eating... We need a... The grass... Dogs that eat bees. grass so alternative. As in turf grass? I'm assuming. No clover, though. Yeah. Uh, so. Y'all are really thinking about this one. Well, this one's kind of tricky. Well, I'm, I'm going to... I don't know... I don't know what alternative they could be looking for. Maybe they need to be thinking about which of the warm season grasses. Yeah, like St. Augustine or something? St. Augustine or, or yeah. Centipede, possibly, yeah. or or even some of your turf, uh, your like Tiff Sport Bermuda yeah. grass, which is a very fine-bladed Bermuda. Uh, those are, of course, all warm are season. turf grasses, and they all are warm yeah. season, which would be more uh, attuned to the climatic conditions in texas over most of it anyway and i don't know if you're in the you could be in the panhandle and they could be completely different it could Correct. be much colder than it is here for instance mm-hmm. uh because essentially is in the uh, central pla- uh, prairie Plains, areas yeah. I'm just, <laughs> i've never seen austin so stumped before I'm, he's staring at the question well they have bee eating dogs <laughs> my dogs like to chase bees I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, my dog will go after a bee or two but I mean, they're exciting. They're cute little bugs that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. it's got, it's got we can't plan anything because our dogs keep eating the bees. <laughs> I'm thinking they just don't want clover because it will attract a lot of bees. Okay. And, right. You know, yeah, that's, yeah that's, that's what they're saying. Yeah. With the clover. So, you know, I, I really don't know of another ground cover that would be as. Um, that would cover as well as a grass or a you know warm season. Yeah, yeah they grass. might use some type of a sedum or something. Yeah, I thought sedum, looking, uh, maybe a creeping thyme. Uh, there's some that are pretty tight that you can yeah, kind of step and on. We, and we yeah. don't know whether this is sun or shade, so yeah. it, right. that makes it a little more difficult. Also, if it's in Texas, I'm assuming it's probably it's sun. sun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So right, I don't cool. know if that helps you or not, but hopefully so. Yep, that's my favorite question we've ever. Had. All right, I, yeah, I enjoyed that got me tickled. Listening right. and watching you guys figure that one out. <laughs> All right, final question. It's a rose question. Oh God, what's the best way <laughs> and time to trim back knockout roses? Oh, it, knock uh, it anytime. Three name, thirty. Name a, name a day. <laughs> yeah. Name a time. Whatever just you feel like it. <laughs> Flip your calendar and just point at a day. I mean, yeah, yeah. Much. I cut mine all the way back to the dirt. I don't even remember when. But I mean, we I mean, cut ours out here in. multiple times a season to keep I'm, them in yeah. check. Yeah, I mean, ideally, what I would say is, you know, if you want to have like the perfect round plant that's just full of blooms, do it uh, early spring, mm-hmm. uh, and then you'll really have this, like February, yes, yeah. yes, or late winter. Because they probably already are pushing yes. new leaves yes. even at that point. They're, they're dormant for like one day a year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't think, it's, a lot of years, mine don't even drop all the no. leaves. No, they, they won't. Yeah. Uh, and you cannot cut one too severely. No, no, if Particularly no. once uh, uh, knockout roses get so big, yeah. many of them, that it may be necessary to cut it to the ground. Oh, I mean, done, literally, like this tall. Yes, yeah, so I've done that at least. I've had uh, blushing pink knockouts for 15 years, and I've done it at least four times where I've just taken them to the ground. Yep, clear cut. It yeah. makes it, they just come out more vigorous, you yes, know, whenever yeah. you get new green canes, yeah. everything just looks better. Yeah, and every time I do it, that year and the next year, they're, or they're, they look awesome. That's the best. Yeah, yeah. it really yeah. is. So. And then multiple times throughout the season, you know, after they're done with their first big full flush of blooms and that's done, you know, we talk about deadheading roses and some roses you want to deadhead more particularly, eh, not knockouts. After they're done and they're faded and you need a deadhead, just just cut them, you know, yeah, take get them you back. Some, get some shears and uh-huh. cut them. Go nuts on them. Yeah, Go and out. invest in good shears. Yes, you, know, don't, you know, the cheapest shears you can find are just that the cheapest shears you can, but they're not good for anything. No. I don't know what no. you can really cut with them. So yeah. invest in a good a pair of ARS shears, for instance. That are, I mean, they are now they are dangerous. Be careful. They're, they're dangerous. Yes. They're they are like very long scissors that have. Yeah. So, yes. but they're wonderful for trimming uh, things that are particularly delicate, like boxwood, for instance, out there in front of you guys, if you want to really shape things nicely, they do a great job of that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. keeping them clean is also another big part of it. I don't talk a lot about uh, sheer maintenance, but, you know, WD-40 and a little uh, a little scraping uh, tool to clean off the sap off of them really does a lot to keep them cutting sharp. 
Well, that and also if you have any worries, particularly with roses, of mm -hmm. uh, the uh, virus, rose rosette, uh, it may behoove you. And, you, you know, a lot of landscapers, good landscapers, will disinfect their, their trimmers between mm -hmm. jobs because they don't want to carry a virus. And if you've got boxwood and you have uh, a, a company that does maintenance for you trimming-wise, Provide their your own shears for them. Don't let them bring them shears yeah, you, because the boxwood sure. boxwood blight is is can be a really bad problem and it can be transferred right on shears. You don't want to do that. Yeah. Use your shears or either that just trim them yourself and don't yes. allow others to do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, there we go. We've we've run out of time. That was quick today. We, was we did go today. quickly. Uh, we want to thank all the, all of you for support the questions and I uh, think this cast we have here Caroline Austin Adam Tyler you've been pretty quiet today I have but I've also sleeping. been in the zone oh, he yeah. has been in the zone because yes. he stayed up till the twilight zone <laughs> so <laughs> anyway so for us all here uh, at Bates Nursery and Garden Center live from the green room and the at-home show uh, tune in again next week or anytime uh, on YouTube check us out here and uh, we'll see you next time around.